Hello, everyone. We'll soon be gathering together in little small groups and be uh, observing the, the Passover. We'll be washing each other's feet, eating unleavened bread of Passover and a small vial of red wine after we've washed feet. I want to go into some detail with the New Covenant, the New Testament Passover. You might hear some things today that are different from what you have been, uh, what you have believed, or and so it might cause you to ponder and think. I would appreciate you making comments and questions or calling me if you do have any comments or questions. Please do remember to be checking the audio sermons um, as well as the video sermons. Uh, in this season, I'll probably be doing more audio because of the time it takes to get videos out. But um, also check out the blogs. We're doing blogs on Passover season as well. So um, and we'd love to hear comments from any of you or ratings on them so we have some idea of how you think we're doing. More importantly, what God thinks, but thank you all. More and more people are coming to keep Passover, the Days of Unleavened Bread, including many more evangelicals and Jews for Jesus and so on. But it's, it's, it's profound to me. So anyway, at the original Passover in Exodus 12:23. God would protect homes from the destroyer angel. Uh, God himself would oversee it all, but he would block that angel from killing anybody in that home if it, if it was covered by the blood. Anyway, the destroyer angel, to all the homes that would not were not covered by blood, would kill all the firstborn males who were in the houses, not marked by one thing, the blood of the lamb. We're going to read that shortly. It was males who were the firstborn who were killed, 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 because in Exodus 13, it goes on to talk about redeeming the firstborn males. Sometimes that question comes up, what if it was a, what if the firstborn was a girl? The only time I could find that firstborn referred to a girl was in the children of Lot, the two daughters, who was the oldest daughter, the firstborn daughter. And um, the others were dead. All he had was two girls at that point. And that's the only time I can find it referring to a daughter. But I really believe this was firstborn males of man and beast. Israelites were safe if they'd killed their lamb and took its blood and used hyssop branches and splashed the lamb's blood on their doorpost. The hyssop was a medicinal weed almost, but it, it had many, many medicinal properties, cleansing properties. And even David talked about, cleanse me with hyssop and I shall be clean. And even Yeshua on the cross was offered uh, a sponge filled with cheap wine, sour wine. Um, if we have time, we'll go into that too. They use hyssop. Exodus 12, verses 12 to 13. <clears throat> Jehovah speaking, I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am Jehovah. Every living thing practically was a god in Egypt, except one thing. They did not make a god out of the lamb. But everything else, a dung beetle to a falcon to a cat, a crocodile, everything else was a, was a god. The Nile River was a god. And now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over I will skip over you. I'll pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So the blood was an oat in the Hebrew, a sign, a mark, a miracle, something grand from God. Oat points to great miracles, something marked out as special to God. It shall be a sign, an oat for you when I see the blood. The blood was very special to God. In Exodus 12, verse 3, I'm going to ask you to keep your Bibles open as we go through this and have notes printed out, if at all possible, so we can move quickly. I have a lot to go through. They were to take a lamb, or the lamb, a lamb, or it could have been a goat, kid, kid of a goat, and see. then later on it was to be seen in verse 5, in Exodus 12, verse 5, as your lamb. I like to personalize all this and call it my Messiah, my Father. Not just the Father. I like to say my Father and my Savior, not just the Savior. My Lamb. 
So that's what Exodus 12, 5 teaches us. Personalize it. <clears throat> they were to keep it until the 14th of Abib, the first Hebrew month, and then kill it between the evenings. That's what the Hebrew means, between the evenings. What I look to, there are lots of arguments about what that actually means. I always defer to what God did when God killed his lamb, the lamb of God. And he did it according to what the Pharisees' understanding of between the evenings meant. They understood it that the first evening was 12 to 3 o'clock, noon to 3 o'clock, and the second evening was 3 o'clock to sundown, or roughly 6 o'clock. And so between the evenings would be exactly at 3 p.m. And according to Mark 15, 34, it was exactly at 3 p.m. on Passover day when God sacrificed Yeshua, his lamb. So whatever other arguments say and go through, that's the starting point for me. Between the evenings to me was what God did when he was sacrificed at 3 p.m., on Passover day. God would not be wrong. God was not wrong. So as we come to Passover services this year, 2022, keep in mind the dates on the Gregorian calendar will be different from year to year, usually in March. This year, uh, April 1st marks the new year. Um, and because, uh, and so as, as we do this, I hope that we also will be seen as being under the blood, the precious blood of our Savior. Because Romans 3 says that when that happens, he's passed over. Passover, there you go. Skipped over our former sins. All of this was to demonstrate God's perfect righteousness that we must have faith in through Christ that's being applied to us. It's not our own righteousness, but God's. This is so hard for me to get across to some of you. I've talked and talked and talked about it and read so many scriptures. In Exodus 12, God was not looking for the Israelites' goodness, the Israelites' good marriage, or perfect law-keeping. He was looking for one thing. Do you have faith in the blood of the lamb you've just killed and splashed on your doorpost and the spot above the door, the lintel? Do you have faith in that blood? The lamb's blood prophetically looked forward to Yeshua. These holy days are prophetic in very many senses. Certainly Passover was. Yeshua also said, I am the door. John 10, verse 7 and 9. Now the thief comes, the thief doesn't come through the door. He comes over the walls or something. But I am the door of the, of the sheep. And his arms and head were covered with blood. At Pesah, the Hebrew name for Passover, we come to him and under his protection by his body and by his blood. We must be in awe when we come in this service. We are to partake of the unleavened bread of his cup after we have carefully examined ourselves and realized, boy, do I ever need my Savior. God wants to see our faith is in him, not faith in our own performance. Romans 3, 21 to 26. I'm going to read this from the English Standard Version. Um, the King James and New King James uses language that sometimes struggle with today. So I'll read it out of this one. But you can use whatever translation you want. And as I go through this sermon, many times I'll just refer to a verse for time's sake. But now the righteousness of God, of God, not yours, of God, has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. There's no distinction. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Verse 24, Romans 3, Romans 3, 24, and we are justified, declared righteous, seen as righteous. That's what justified means. We are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward. We're seen as righteous as a gift by his grace. Please, please believe that. It's his righteousness. Verse 25, Jesus Christ, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former 
sins. I hope we're getting it. It was to show, verse 26, his righteousness at the present time, so he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in their own works and their own ability to do everything perfectly right. No, that's not what it says. Justifier of the one who has faith in Yeshua, in Jesus. So we praise our King and Savior. We praise our Heavenly Father as we prepare for a moving Passover. Father in heaven, please guide this message today. Open the minds of the, the, those hearing and speak, Father, your words. Let me convey your heart, your mind on this glorious, wonderful, sacred time we're coming into. Nothing else in your prophecies, nothing else in your plan could even happen without the Passover. We thank you for it and ask your blessing. So we'll talk about the New Covenant Passover, how important it is in the New Covenant, and why, if I have time, is the Passover called Parts of the Days of Unleavened Bread in the Gospels, in Luke 22, verse 1, in Acts 12, verse 3 to 5. Um, before Passover, God, uh, Herod had killed James. Then he took Peter, because it had pleased the leading Jews so much, intending to kill Peter after Passover. So they, they called the whole seven days Passover. Ezekiel forty five twenty one. there it says Passover, a feast of seven days. And Luke 22, verse 1, and so on. So we'll talk about that probably maybe some other time. But just understand that Passover was considered the whole time by Jews and even in Scripture. And do we even have to keep Passover in the New Covenant? So... Now, is Passover and, and are the days of unleavened bread the same as in the Old Testament? Let me tackle that real quickly first now here. We're not trying to replicate the Old Testament Passover when we have Passover. We're, you are not to sacrifice a lamb. The Lamb of God has been sacrificed, so that's done. Have faith in Him. We do not sacrifice a lamb. Yeshua is our Passover lamb, as 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says. We do not eat it with our sandals on, standing up, staff in hand like they did. Yeshua took sandals off and washed feet. They reclined at Passover in Yeshua's time. And we don't splash blood on our lintels and doorposts. Christ's sacrifice is done one time for all time for everyone who accepts it. So there are some differences in New Covenant Passover and Old Testament. Actually, the New Testament Passover is so vital that we must prepare ourselves ahead of time for especially the bread and the wine service. We should not just show up or rush in at the last minute at the gathering place. You know, I remember so well growing up, and I was about six or seven, watching Mom take the bread and wine. We all were in a little circle in front of her. I've got a picture of that. And then when I was immersed, when I was baptized in water at age 18, the first Passover I partook of, the bread and the wine and the foot washing, it was my first one. I didn't know if I was doing everything right. And I think I was overly concerned about that, and I was distracted, but I learned to appreciate the Passover so much more as the years went by. Anyway, Passover's in the first month. God set Abib as the first month. When they came out of Egypt from slavery, God says, I want a whole change, a whole time change for you. Your life is changing. So we're going to call this the new year. It had been in the fall. From the fall to the spring, the Jews still keep a, a, a civil new year. Is that the word for it? In the fall. And then a religious new year in the spring. When we leave our Egypt, this present evil world, we also have our new year, a new beginning, a new faith in Yeshua. The new year vary from year to year in God's calendar. Uh, I mean, in the Gregorian calendar, uh, it's, it's usually in March, but this year it's in April. So it'll vary in the Gregorian calendar, not in God's calendar. It's always the same dates. And remember, God's new moons are not when you can't see a moon, the dark of the moon, as your wall calendar will show new moons. But, the, but God's new moons are the first visible sliver of light of the moon. Exodus 12, verse 1 and 2. The Lord, Yehovah, spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month, this month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. 
And then he goes on in Leviticus 23, verse 1 and 2, where he lists the Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath, and all the holy days. <clears throat> Leviticus 23, 1 and 2, Yehovah spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, The feast of Yehovah, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, are my feasts. The feast, the Hebrew word here for feast is moed. Divine appointments. Yehovah is saying, I'm making a date with you. I'm making a divine appointment with you. I expect you to be there. Don't be a no-show. Then the holy convocation, the word for convocation is a mikra, a public meeting and a reading. And so we should come prepared and really appreciate the fact we've been invited to meet and be with our Creator on these holy days. So as we prepare for Passover season, on your knees I would advise you to speak out real consciousness to your Father, that you feel so humbled that somehow He has picked you to be His child, chosen by Him personally, personally, to be one of His children. He, God the Father, is the one who picked you to be his son or daughter. Feel and praise for him for that high calling as you speak with our Father. Like the early Israelites coming out of Pharaoh's slavery, we're also freed from Satan's grasp. We're called to be pilgrims, in fact, sojourners. We're not a part of the world system, Hebrews eleven thirteen. They were sojourners, pilgrims, First Peter 2, verses 11 and 12. Live your life as pilgrims, not part of this world. We should be almost like foreigners in this life to the world. We're commanded in Revelation 18, 4, come out of her, my people. So we don't watch. We try to find ways that, what does it mean to be in the world and to come out of Babylon? Even that very phrase, come out of her, my people, is very, to me, uh, sexual. It's a sexual phrase, come out of her, my people. He's saying, you guys are just way too intimate with this world. Stop it. Come out of it. So we don't watch the Oscars, the Emmys, the Grammys. And we won't watch any movie that uses profanity and F-words. We just don't. That means we don't watch a lot of movies unless uh, they're the kind that have been edited somehow. Why should we bring F-words into our home and to our ears? When it's our choice whether to do it or not. So why should we do it? Your home's your castle. Keep Satan out. We don't watch any demonic movies like any Harry Potter with its witchcraft, sorcery, demons, and other demonic me uh, movies. Stop it. Let's not do it. Come out of her, my people. Quit fornicating with the world. So as you examine yourself, <clears throat> also examine how much you're still in the world in Babylon. Do we like and go by the world's priorities of wealth, of what fun is, of what's important, what your goal should be? Recommit to be a seeker after God. Recommit that you're not going to be late as sin and lukewarm, but zealous for God. And um, don't be skipping days of prayer like late as sins would be doing. They're not very zealous. If you think you're blessed because God has gifted you with a lot of material things, um, I'm rich and increased with goods, the Laodiceans say. I've been blessed. God says, no, you're not. Ask yourself, if you would die for Christ, you have to carry your cross daily. If you're carrying a cross, you're on your way to death. So, anyway, are you ready for Passover? It's very clear the Apostle Paul taught even the Gentiles to keep Passover in the days of unleavened bread. We get a lot of the best teachings about Passover. Passover, and preparing for it from his instruction to the Gentile Corinthians. There were Jews there as well, but it was primarily a Gentile Greek church. So it was at Passover, at age 12, when Jesus got separated from his mom and family. You can find that in Luke 2, the end of the ch ch chapter. And then you can find Yeshua's first big miracle of changing water to red wine was in Cana, was also just before Passover. He was thinking, he said to his mom, Hey, mom, my hour has not come. Why are you asking me about wine? Because he knew wine pictured his blood. 
and the, the the man who was overseeing it would never have complimented just grape juice as the best wine, the best you've left ever. I'll, I'll do a blog about wine and grape juice. Uh, we need to be using wine, folks. I know a lot of you use grape juice. We'll, we'll talk about that some other time. Yeshua had them fill six water pots, pots used for purification. All that water he turned into red wine. Remember, he wasn't trying to get everybody drunk. Uh, weddings back then would go typically at least three days and many times seven days. The wedding feast and food and drink and all of that. So though he produced a lot of red wine, between 120 and 136 gallons, that probably had to fulfill the needs for many days. And John 2, verse 13 to 22 says all that happened just before Passover. And Passover was a pilgrim festival like Pentecost and Feast of Tabernacles, where they were expected, at least the males were. Many times the whole family went, as in Yeshua's parents' case. But at least all the men were expected to be worshiping in Jerusalem. <clears throat> and then we see another example that Yeshua, right after Cana, it was just before Passover, days of unleavened bread. So what did Yeshua do? He went to Jerusalem. What's the first thing he did? It was before Passover and before days of unleavened bread or right about that time. So what did he do? He deleavened the temple. He spiritually deleavened it. They got rid of sin and wrong behavior. Now that's, that's a point too, as you deleaven. Folks, spend more time on spiritual deleavening than you do on the physical. So many of you are so zealous about reading every possible list of possible ingredients that could be leavening agents that are dozens of items long. And you spend forever going through everything in your house. By the time you're done, you realize, you know, I haven't fasted or prayed or sought God or spiritually asked him to help me with some weaknesses still in my life. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about. So, Passover was so important that God actually uh, made it possible that if you missed the first Passover, there was a second Passover on the 14th of the second month. And that's in Numbers 9, verses 9 to 14. I'll write it all out in the notes I have here. But I just want you to be aware there is a second Passover. But someone was not supposed to take that nonchalantly. So, in verse Numbers 9, verse 13, the man who is clean and is not on a journey and skips Passover, that, that man's going to be in trouble, Yeshua said. That man's going to be in trouble. So, um, anyway, go back and read that on your own. For time's sake, I'm going to keep on going. God wants you to keep Passover, and that was before Pentecost. And then Jesus' last Passover meal, or last supper, as some people call it. Paul mentions the last supper. Yeshua does not. At, let's look at the Passover that Yeshua kept with his disciples. He definitely did call it Passover. Some people make a big point of trying to prove that that wasn't his Passover. But he did. He absolutely did call it Passover. Let's read it. Matthew 26, verses 17 to 19. This is when he introduces the emblems of foot washing, the bread and the wine. So I keep the foot washing, the bread and wine date on the eve of the 14th of Abib because that's when Yeshua did. So that's when I do it as well. Then we have the main meal the following night. We call the night to be much observed or the night to be observant. The end of the 14th, beginning of the 15th. Matthew 26, verses 17 to 19. Now on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city, and there will be a certain man. Say to him, The teacher says, My time's at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house. 
So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them. They prepared the Passover. It's clearly being called the Passover. Mark 14, Luke 22 say about the same thing. They add a few details that the two that he sent into the city were Peter and John. And they said that, and they told him in Luke 22, I'll put the scriptures in the notes, that you're going to see a man carrying a pitcher of water. Now that's unusual. That's why he would stand out. It was usually the women who carried pitchers of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. I'm in Luke 22, verse 11. And then say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where's the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Verse 30, so they went and found it just as he had said, and they prepared the Passover. So that meal that he had that night on the eve of the 14th, whatever your other explanations are, the Bible says was the Passover. Preparing the Passover meant to select the lamb. I don't know that they still selected the lamb on the 10th by this time and kept it for four days. In Exodus 12 they did. But anyway, they were to take the lamb, kill it, roast it in its entirety, not boiled, but roasted. And then by the time they'd eat it, it was clearly into the evening now. But clearly, Yeshua called that day the Passover. I mention this because there are lots of speakers trying to show it really wasn't the Passover. So anyway, that's when we do the foot washing of the eve of the 14th of the Hebrew calendar. Now let's jump over to 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 26. A lot of people get down to get down these nitty-gritty details and forget the heart we should have our heart totally in this. Paul focuses on taking the Passover in a worthy manner, not carelessly, or you'll be under God's judgment. It's one big reason that the Passover service can be witnessed by children, but should not be partaken, should not be involved with children. They can't, they can't examine themselves. They can't understand the spiritual part of it enough. So it's, 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 for, it's for baptized members. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26. I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it. And he said, take and eat. This is my body. Okay, the bread pictured his body. I want you to really understand that. It doesn't pick, depict you keeping sin out of your life like we've all been taught for so long that is so wrong it depicts the body and life of Yeshua I have a blog that I posted on correctly understand the unleavened bread I really suggest you read it and go in detail on that take and eat this is my body broken for you for you for you take it personally do this in remembrance of me. Take it and eat it in remembrance of me. Not Egypt. In this whole record of what transpired in their conversation, never is Egypt brought up. I'm not saying it wasn't brought up, but it's not recorded as something that was what they talked about. In the Old Covenant, they were to talk about God bringing them out of Egypt. That's what Jews today still talk about. In the same manner, he took the cup after supper. But, but here he says, do this in remembrance of me. Not Egypt, not the lambs of Exodus 12, because all of that pointed to me giving you deliverance from the real slave master, not Pharaoh, but Satan, whom Pharaoh depicted. In the same manner, he also took... So when you talk about your meal and all that. Yeah, go ahead and talk about Exodus 12 and crossing the Red Sea and all that if you want. But make sure, make sure that most of your time is spent talking about Yeshua, what his sacrifice and his body meant. Faith in him, just as the Jews had to have faith that this blood they were splashing was going to do the trick and, 
and finally soften Pharaoh's heart enough to let them all go. In the same manner, 1 Corinthians 11.25, he took the cup after supper. Now, I want you to focus that the focus of Yeshua's comments and here and also in the Gospels was not in the contents of the cup, but the cup itself. Although it included the contents, of course. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. So he introduces the new covenant at Passover. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and, eat, and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And the Lord's death was on Passover. So generally, my wife and I, we do this kind of service on Passover. And then verse 27 onward. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, King, King James says unworthily, I believe, in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, not, not examine anybody else, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. After you've examined yourself, if you're anything like me, in prayer and seeking after God and looking at my life, I will say to my Father in heaven, to my Savior, Yeshua, my King, Yeshua, my, my Prince, my, Yeshua, the Son of God, boy, do I need you. I've examined myself. I value you what you've done. I'm going to eat like you said examine himself and so let him eat it doesn't say examine yourself and then decide to skip the appointment with god that's even worse so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup so please don't skip passover because you see that you still fall so far short of the mark and we will until totally our bodies are changed from corruptible to inter incorruptible For he, verse 29, who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment, condemnation, judgment to himself. Because you're not discerning the Lord's body. And because of this, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. You're not discerning the Lord's body in two ways. The actual body of Yeshua, not appreciating it enough. But also the body of Yeshua is the church, is the ecclesia, the called out ones. And the way they were treating each other in Corinth, going to court against each other, having party division spirits and uh, cliques and so on, and big fights over hair length, big fights over a man's role and a woman's role, and all the different things and the sexual immorality that was rampant in the church. You were not esteeming the Lord's body. You weren't cleaning things up. It pictures Christ, and they were picturing Christ terribly. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. So maybe if we would esteem each other, the body of Christ, esteem the body literally of Christ better, we would see more healings. I have a whole sermon on that. And um, you can look up or type in how the Passover... Passover and, and, and healing. Just say Passover and healing, and I think it should, should pop, pop up. Now let's go through this again a little more carefully. Okay. Do this in remembrance of me. Not the Exodus 12 lambs. I've said that already. But focus on Christ. 11.24, 1 Corinthians 11.24. This bread is my body broken for you. Take the Passover as a relationship. That Christ died for you. Sure, he died for everyone, but take it personally. Feel God's love for you, for you specifically, more this time of the year. I don't know if we feel that the way we should. In Exodus 13, verse 8, talking again, going back, looking back at the Passover. <clears throat> 
God tells them, Moses tells them, or God does, and you shall tell your son in that day, this is done because what Yehovah, Yehovah did for me. Did for me. Don't just talk about him dying for all the world. God so loved the world. Yes, but he loved you. And he did this for me when I came out of Egypt, when I came out of this world. Galatians 2, verse 20 and 21, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives. I want that old me to be dead. Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in him, in the Son of God, who loved me, who loved me, who loved me. We have to come to the point where you understand that too. In spite of our sins, in spite of our failures, in spite of our past, Almighty Father in heaven, our Father, has apparently chosen you and me to be part of all of this. That means he loved you and gave himself, so who loved me and gave himself for me. First, it's Galatians 2, verse 20. Gave himself for me, not just everybody else, for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. If righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. He says, by faith, I live by faith in the Son of God. <clears throat> and then in 11.25, 1 Corinthians 11.25, this is my cup. This cup is a new covenant in my blood. In remembrance of me, he says, um, keep in mind that in John 6, when Yeshua had that really strong talk about eating of his flesh and drinking of his blood. Many left him after that. But in John 6, verses 53 and 54, Yeshua said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. This is how important Passover is. How important it is. If you don't partake of it, you have no life. Verse 54, whoever eats my flesh... Now, I think there are going to be exceptions to the rule when God understands. If you're crucified on a cross, you can't even get baptized, let alone take Passover. And yet Christ still said to the thief on the cross, I will see you. I say to you today, he says, I will see you in paradise. And so at the resurrection, at some point, Yeshua and he will team up again. He hadn't been baptized. He hadn't received the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying he's going to come up in the first resurrection, but at some point, he's going to meet Christ in paradise. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my... That's what Christ said, right? Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. At the last day. <clears throat> Let's talk about the cup versus the contents of the cup. Drinking the cup meant a total commitment, included, of course, the contents of the cup. It meant participating and accepting whatever was going to be in store for you and me. It was really a marriage proposal. A, a Hebrew man would... would in proposing to his sweetheart, would have a glass of wine, a cup of wine, and he would propose that they, he, she drinks of it. And if she accepted that glass of wine and drank from it, that was saying, yes, whatever is in store for us together, I, I, I accept it. And Yeshua at other times said to James and John, when they asked to be at Jesus' right hand and left hand, he asked them if they were able to drink of his cup. Are you willing to go through what you're going to have to go through to be at my right and left. And they said, yes. And he says, indeed, you will go through the baptism I'm baptized with. You will drink of my cup. That's all in Mark 10, verses 36 to 40. But who sits on my right and left? That's the Father's decision. So anyway, from there we go to the blood of the Son of God. And these are things we need to ponder. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read all the verses. I will give you the verses. There are so many. I recommend, I recommend that you do a Bible study, spend an hour or two studying these passages I'm going to give you on your knees if you can, if you don't have too much arthritis, or bow down somehow, some way, and just ask God to help you really be ready for Passover. Fr frankly, the Passover pictures both the horror of Passover, the death of Christ and all that, and the joy of Passover, being redeemed and forgiven. 
It pictures the severity and the goodness of God, as Paul puts it in Romans 11.22. Both the severity, the severity was on, on his own son, on Christ. He was going to take it all for us. Anyway, the fruit of the vine that they partook of pictured his blood. I'm going to do a blog on, is the fruit of the vine grape juice or is it wine? And I hope you'll read it when I write it out. We drink the fruit of the vine to remember different things. Life is in the blood. And, and so when you give the blood, that makes atonement for our souls. But it's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to forgive sins. We're told in Hebrews... But life is in the blood, is Leviticus 17.11. The blood pictures his life that he gave for us. It shows us the intense love. Father has for us to give up his only son, and, and Yeshua Christ has to die for us while we were enemies and sinners, ungodly. All that's in Romans 5. I really recommend you read a lot of Romans 5. And that God has for us, the love God has for us, that he'd give up his only son, so he'd be able to restore the relationship with all the rest of us. And his poor only son was the one who took it on the chin, took all of it. The Passover cup is not just a ritual. I need you to ponder it, be ready for it. But the new covenant in his blood is what we're talking about. As Yeshua said, his shed blood pays our own death penalty that we incurred due to our sins. He pays it for us. Ephesians 1.7, Colossians 1.14. And because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Blood had to be shed. It wasn't just the blood he shed from the scourging. Probably a lot. It wasn't just the blood from the nails being hammered into his hands and ankles. But I really believe it was that spear that, w that had been thrust. The, the, the way it's read... The, the sequence is given, it makes it sound like he was already dead and then they thrust the spear in. No, you, you have to give up, your life is in the blood. And I believe the Greek could be translated and, and, and so the Roman soldier had pierced Jesus. So he was dead. And out came blood and water. That shed blood now redeems us, buys us back. And his blood takes away the wrath of God. I have all the scriptures in my notes. Not written out. I want you to, purposely, because I want you to look them up in your own Bible and read them and study them before Passover. God's wrath is satisfied by Jesus' sacrifice for us in Romans 5, 9. I will read Romans 5, verses 6 to 11. I, it's just too full of information to skip. But I hope you'll reread these again. Romans 5, verse 6. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. We were bad. And he still died for us. For scarcely for a righteous man will someone die, yet perhaps even a good man would dare even die. But God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been justified, now we're declared righteous. Because we're righteous? Having been justified by His blood. You and I should be getting better in our obedience towards God. We should be getting better at it. But we're declared righteous by the blood. We shall be saved from wrath through Him. If when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received the reconciliation. We were so bad, God had cut us off. Isaiah 59, verse 2, Your sins have separated you from me. But now in Christ... We have been reconciled with God the Father, and we are forgiven. We're given the Holy Spirit after baptism, laying on of hands, and that baptism guarantees our salvation. It's the earnest, the guarantee. It's the down payment. It's different than the new covenant. So now when I sin, am I cut off from God? We'd be cut off every day. You would be too. Be honest. 
Now when I sin, yes, I have to repent. And yes, I have to come back to God. And he, but I'm there. He's not gonna. He's not gonna cut me off any more than he did his prodigal son. His blood washes away our sins that made us so filthy. First John one verses seven and eight. Love those verses. And the tense is that it continues to cleanse us because we continue to still sin. And so, just like your body continues to cleanse a new cut, and you see the pus form and all that. His blood, in the same way, continues to cleanse us. We do have to repent and keep repenting as we sin. Every single sin is now gone and washed away, no matter how filthy it was. Colossians 1.20 says His blood makes peace with God. Hebrews 10.14, one of my favorite verses, is shed blood by one offering. He has perfected forever those who are being sanctified, has perfected, has perfected, past tense. I want you to hear my sermons on perfection God's way. Just type in the word uh, God's perfection, and uh, it's all about that. God sees us from, God sees the end from the beginning. His blood reconciles us. I read that in Romans 5. So that allows us to have an awesome relationship with our Father, and now because we're reconciled and the sins forgiven and we are cleansed and we're holy and we're perfected forever and all who are being sanctified, guess what? Hebrews 10, 19 and 20 says, Now we can have boldness to enter the holiest place in the whole universe, the very throne room of God our Father, by the blood of Jesus. Because I've accepted the blood of Jesus. When I think all people have forsaken me, I feel down, maybe I've been sinful, maybe no one wants to talk to me or have me in their fellowship, and I feel down, maybe many of you feel the same way. I can repent of any sins, I can come before God my Father and say, God my Father, I'm coming to your very presence because of my Savior, Yeshua. I can come boldly, not timidly, because of Yeshua, because of Passover. I need you to really ponder this before we come to Passover. John 17, 23, in the prayer that Yeshua gave, he says, Father, let them know that you have loved them as you have loved me. His shed blood, his life now covering us, shows that God loves us as much, maybe even more so, because we didn't have to die for our sins, but he made his son die so we could be part of him. God loves us as much as his beloved Yeshua. Can you imagine that? That's true. His blood brings us into his new covenant, Luke 22, verse 20. We now can have victory over Satan and sin by the blood. I want you to read these. Revelation 12, verses 10 and 11. And by him, his death and resurrection, we will be presented holy and perfect. So many of you are trying to get out the spots and wrinkles. And so we should be fighting sin. But the one with the spot remover and the one with the iron to take out the wrinkles is Jesus Christ. Nobody else. By him, by his resurrection, we will be presented holy and perfect. So, please, please, I hope you're, you're I, I need to read that one. Colossians 1, that's just too good. Colossians 1, 21 to 23. And you who were once alienated enemies in your mind of, by wicked works, yet now he's reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy. I'm reading Colossians 1, 22 now. To present you holy, blameless, above reproach in his sight, if indeed you continue in the faith grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. All right, so in the body of his flesh through death, Colossians 1.22, to present you and me holy, blameless, above reproach in his sight. Doesn't matter what other people think about you. 
ultimately it's what matters in God's sight, isn't it? So, I just love that. And remember in Exodus 12, the focus was on the blood of the Lamb, now in the New Covenant. Uh, well, back then, God didn't say, if I see you have a good marriage and you're kind, or you're righteous, you're keeping my law, I'll, I'll pass over. No, he says, when I see the blood. So ponder all that about the blood as we come to Passover. And then Paul says, if you eat it in an unworthy manner. So please take the time to examine yourself, like verse 28 says. And then do take and eat of the bread, drink of the cup. It doesn't say examine yourself and then decide not to eat it. Become a no-show to the appointment of God. No, no, don't you dare do that. Don't be a no-show. Every year I, I hear someone say, I just wasn't qualified enough. I wasn't good enough to come. Well, if you thought you were good enough to come, that's self-righteous. My righteousness is in Christ. 11, 1 Corinthians 11, 29, 30, I have a whole sermon on this connection between Passover and healing. I just type that in, connection between Passover and healing. And if you take it in an unworthy manner, that's why some of you are dying. I definitely hear, recommend you hear that sermon. I think it's referring both to Christ's body and to the church. Now we should come to Passover and the night to be observant, which is what it really means, with holy awe. We just might also start seeing some dr dramatic healings. Let's come with holy awe. Yeshua introduced a new emblem of foot washing. We understand it as a symbol of being a servant. No one had washed feet when they came in. The only one to get up and wash everyone's feet was the Son of God. God didn't think it below him to do the lowest servant's job. And he said, the greatest among you, in other places, he said, the greatest among you will be the greatest servant of all. A true servant serves. That's, that's one meaning. We all know that meaning, I think. The next meaning, 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 is foot washing is not just about serving. It's also to remind us that when you wash someone else's feet, we're acknowledging to that person that I and you see that person as having been cleansed by no one other than Christ himself. You see that person is clean no matter what you've heard about them or seen about them in their past. This point, I believe, is a huge point. I even say that to the person whose feet I'm washing. Christ is already washing, has already washed your feet, I say to him. And I'm just acknowledging that I see you as washed. And then we come to Passover week, 11 week. Uh, John 6, verses 49 to 51. 51, I'm the living bread, which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he'll live forever. The bread I give is my flesh. In verse 53, we read earlier, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, drink his blood, you won't have, won't have any life in you. And I'm rushing because I'm trying to do what some of you have asked to make these shorter, but there's so much here about Passover. Okay, I'm going to put these scriptures in the notes when you do your follow-up study. I pray you will. Don't just rely on this. Go deeply into those verses I've just, given, I've just given you. Also, I will tell you, clearly partaking of the bread and the wine of Passover... You can't skip Passover and expect to be in the first resurrection unless you just simply, simply could not, like if you're nailed to a cross or something. Clearly partaking of the bread and wine of Passover is only for those in a covenant relationship with God. In the Old Testament, that meant that they had to be circumcised. That's what made you the covenant. In the New Testament, we're circumcised in heart, Romans 2, the end of it says. And we have made this relationship covenant, this commitment to God, even in the Old Testament, Gentiles had first to be circumcised, show they were in covenant with Yehovah. So only baptized brethren who have committed themselves to God through Christ should partake of the bread and wine at Passover. I've known too many kids and teenagers who've done this and seemed holy and righteous at 12 and 13 and 9, only when their late teens uh, had left God totally. This is not for children or the unbaptized. I'll leave in the notes some comments about what kind of bread was it that Yeshua had. It had to be leavened bread, unleavened, unleavened bread, if it was Passover. The Greek word there, artos, is 
is used for bread generally, not just leavened bread, but it's used for show bread, which definitely was unleavened. So go ahead and read that. And then uh, we come to days of unleavened bread. Make sure you eat unleavened bread all seven days. That pictures the life of Christ. Read my blog, Correctly Understand Unleavened Bread. If you look at a sheet of matzah, you'll see stripes baked on it. Jews don't even know what they're doing as they bake that. They're, pic they're picturing the stripes, the scourging stripes Yeshua went through. And you'll see holes in perforations if you hold it up to the light. To us New Testament believers, the stripes picture scourging, and the holes picture his crucifixion. Holes pierced his hands and feet and ankles, and then the spear thrust into his side. The time is coming that all will see him, including those who pierced him. Yeshua says he's the bread from heaven. He's the manna. Let's read one more. He is our life now. Colossians 3, verses 2 and 4. That's why you've got to take the unleavened bread every day. I know it's been preached a lot lately. You don't have to. Nonsense. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. That's what it says. Colossians 3, verse 2 to 4, Set your mind on things above, um, not on things of the earth. For you died, or supposed to have, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. So eating unleavened bread does not picture us putting leaven out of our lives though we should be trying our best to overcome sin. Of course we should. What it's depicting is the life of Christ. Unleavened bread has never been leavened before. What pictures us are the leavened products we threw out that depict the old self that still sometimes sins, still sometimes is therefore leavened. So we put out the old man, as Paul calls it, and we replace it with new bread that's never been in our home or our life before. Unleavened bread has never been leavened before, ever. That can only picture Yeshua. Can't picture me, can't picture you. So we've been leavened and still sin from time to time. So when you eat unleavened bread, it's not picturing you overcoming sin. It's picturing accepting the life of Christ who is now our life, who is now our righteousness, and we're asking him, please come into my life. Please live in me the way you lived before. Please convict me by your spirit when I sin. Please lead me to repentance as I do. And please let me grow in the image of you and God our Father. You can't take leaven out of something already leavened. No matter how hard you try. You can only replace it. Chuck it out. You can only replace it with unleavened bread. The same way, the only way to true, complete, mature perfection is we must become perfect as God is perfect, can only happen if God grants us His very own perfection. Please read my blog on this, correctly understand the unleavened bread, and, and, and hear the sermons on God's perfection. I'll uh, put the blog connection here. Here I've uh, it's titled, Have We Misunderstood Unleavened Bread? Uh, but, but click on that and they'll put you to that. God grants us his perfect righteousness and holiness by faith. I give you scriptures on that. I've talked about that so many times. Please believe the Bible. You will never be perfectly righteous on your own strength. Galatians 2.21, For if righteousness could come by the law, then Christ died in vain. Second Corinthians 5.21 For he who knew no sin was made sin, declared to be sin for you, that we might become the righteousness of God through him. This is righteousness, justification by faith, as Romans 5.1 says. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. I don't see myself perfect yet. I don't see perfection in my life yet. But I have faith that God does because he's seeing his own covering me and when I my, my imperfection, my corruption puts on incorruption, that will be the final time when I will truly be perfect. God credits and imputes his righteousness to us by faith. And I give a lot of scriptures on this. 
I, for one, will definitely choose God's righteousness over mine any day, all day long, and I hope the rest of you will come to see it. This is why we must take and eat of his life, pictured by the Passover bread and the days of unleavened bread. Father, we close now, and we come to you, and we just ask you in Yeshua's mighty name that this Passover will be a very profound Passover for us. We're so close to the very end of the age. And Father in heaven, please count us worthy to escape the things that are coming and to be seen as holy in your eyes. Please come into our life, Yeshua. Please be our life. Help us to focus on you. Not focus on the sins, but focus on you. And like you tell us in Second Corinthians 3, 17 and 18, that as we do that, that's how we will grow to be more like you. As we abide in you, we will bear much fruit. John 15, as you said, Father in heaven, Yeshua, my Savior, our Savior, help us have beautiful, wonderful, glorious, awesome Passover and let us come and be in total awe of you and your Passover, your Yeshua, my Yeshua. In Yeshua, Jesus' mighty name, holy name, amen and amen.